Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Dinesh Abhayasundara from Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee of ISL. Uh, it's great honor for me to uh, welcome you all uh, in this evening uh, on behalf of Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee for another, uh, another great uh, uh, lecture on uh, uh, very, I would say, uh, interesting lecture, uh, public lecture on the topic of uh, MANA wind power and navigation issues uh, will be presented by engineer Mauro Boteju. Engineer Mauro Boteju is a chartered engineer, uh, a member of both Institute of Mechanical Engineering and uh, Institute of Engineering and Technology UK. He is a consultant on wind power, renewable energy, renew renewable energy advocate and environmental activist. Engineer Boteju counts over 25 years of project experience and international environment. He worked as head of project at GE Wind Energy USA, director of engineering at uh, Kavana Hydro, how do you pronounce it, uh, sorry? Kavana. Kavana Hydro Power USA, senior consultant at DME GL Energy, currently he based in Pakistan and engaged in wind power projects, development activities in South Asian region. Today, Engineer Bhatteju is going to educate us on how to protect FUNA and FLORA, enhancing renewable energy, in particularly at MANA, MANA wind power project. So I trust you all will find it very interesting. Over to you, sir. Nice to see so many familiar faces. I hope I'll make your time worthwhile. Okay, so I prepared this talk. I had to review um, the EIA report, which was about 450 pages. There were two volumes. <clears throat> because, and the, and the reason I wanted to give this presentation was because there was so much, uh, uh, there were many opinions, especially from people who were concerned about the avian issue and I felt that some of the opinions uh, expressed uh, were not uh, optimal, they were not accurate uh, and so I felt that maybe it would be useful to engage uh, in a discussion with these groups so a presentation would be a starter. I don't see any avi avian advocacy groups here, people here. Are there any people from any any people from avian advocacy groups here? Anyone? Just one. Who are you with? I'm no, no, but there are organizations that have posted the stuff online and, you know, that birds are getting chopped and minced meat and all this kind of stuff. I wanted to, you know, have, have a discussion with them. Anyway, unfortunately. Um, so, um, what, I, uh, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, these are the items I'm going to cover. I'll basically tell you why MANA is a good place for wind power. I will, I will cover historic avian issues because uh, it's very easy to go on the internet and look at the carnage going on uh, at some wind farms because birds are getting killed for sure, nobody denies that. Uh, then I'll talk about measures, mitigating measures, talk about modern wind turbines and we can talk about MANA and the uh, migratory bird uh, season and the aviation, avian collision risk issues, uh, talk about the transmission line and then wind farms near wetlands because the southern end of MANA Island is uh, it's a Ramsar site like Vakalai Sanctuary. So there is some sensitivity on that as well. Now I'm not, I know a little bit about wind power. I'm not an avian expert, but being in the industry in the US, one is exposed to avian issues. And I was in California. And uh, so one is always following these issues and the measures to mitigate the avian impact and so on. So uh, I'm going to whatever I cover would be based on the familiarity of that experience. Now, this is an old slide, you know, this is um, just to give you an idea of the, uh, 
the, the wind potential you see and basically that's my hope and the mana and then this whole region is with potentially a uh, wind power zone and uh, currently we are looking at onshore in Sri Lanka but you can imagine I would think that within a decade there will be offshore wind power taking place and the Gulf of Mana is a excellent zone for developing offshore wind power. It's shallow waters, calm sheltered waters unlike in the North Sea so the costs are going to be lower and by the way India is already embarking on major wind resource assessment activity offshore uh, in the southern part as well as uh, further up north on the west coast. And uh, another sensitive issue again the turbines are going to cross the migratory bird path so that's something to be discussed as well. What is this? Okay here's the Mena Island uh, orientation it's unique uh, there was some discussions during the environmental hearings there were avian advocacy groups uh, requesting that the project be moved somewhere else uh, then the others saying why don't you put it out at sea um, but uh, as I tell my friends in Pakistan when you go in for wind project development activity and we look at certain locations where there's wind resources I would tell them hey Allah made it that way that's where <laughs> the wind is so you got to be there so the same with um, Mana it's unique because here's the island going um, one of the things in the industry is what we call the predominant wind direction so the predominant wind is the southwest monsoon winds and the island is perpendicular to that and what it's doing is that the winds come in and hit the island and then they hit a stretch of water so it allows the winds to exit without any back pressure so therefore this the resource on land is enhanced because there's unlike the wind hitting land here then it meets back pressure and therefore the velocity of the wind is reduced but here the wind clears fast so that's why this is an excellent location and then there's an, the northeast component blows this way again it comes over open water and crosses land and then goes back to open water again and um, I think I said somewhere about 80 percent of the energy comes from the southwest monsoon and uh, I think about 15 percent from the northeast monsoon so there's about 400 megawatts plus potential I think the ADB study talks about 375 megawatts uh, I think you cannot be static with that number because as you start developing the technology is evolving and you will get more energy capture and capacity on the later units so it will uh, go beyond 400 megawatts so that's one thing one needs one needs to do is to make sure the transmission infrastructure to evacuate all the power from Mana Island is not going to be a constraint as you start coming near the 400 megawatt mark um, okay we go to the next slide now the key drivers uh, in Sri Lanka energy security that you familiar with that and the power sector is a key subset uh, then there's an increasing power demand in Sri Lanka like many other countries especially developing countries uh, and uh, rapid urbanization industry commerce and high-end real estate and so on these are all drivers and then the country currently uh, there is a fossil fuel component I know there's a lot of debate about how much fossil fuel there should be in the in the power mix it's an uh, easy thing to keep adding fossil fuel plants and and uh, um, you know increase uh, the power sector output but there are other negatives coming there I mean in terms of climate change concerns carbon tax and then we have to exploit the fact that the technology green technology is ex advancing rapidly and the costs are coming down as well and this carbon tax issue is very very important this is being discussed even in Trump's uh, regime because there are Republican senators who are making the business case for taxing the carbon footprint in other words they say we should tax because they're saying we are going we're paying for going green so we should tax goods that are not green they, they don't have green credentials so that we should tax them and then compensate uh, the consumers or some other party who is being burdened by meeting green requirements so that's something that Sri Lanka should be aware of 
Okay, so let's go to how the avian issues came up. I mean, the US was a uh, lead country in terms of wind power, same with, was with Holland and, and Denmark, but in the US, as usual, when you have incentives, this was in the 80s, it's, it's like the gold rush. This is the wind rush. I mean, people are putting turbines all over the place. I mean, there was, I mean this, this slide, this is raptor country, raptor birds of prey, because there's a lot of ground rodents, rabbits and squirrels and so on. But you can see this, they've just been, it's almost like they went in a plane and dropped wind turbine seeds. You see, and that's what they've done. And uh, there was a lot of carnage going on with regards to avian activity here. And that was a big, big negative to the industry. And, they are, and the ultimate horror story was a place off east of San Francisco. It's only about an hour's drive from San Francisco called Altamont Pass. And this was rolling hills. And the region also has morning and evening fog and they have a lot of uh, raptor, you know, birds of prey, golden eagles and hawks and so on. A lot of rodents on the ground and then there were all these turbines scattered everywhere and they were getting slaughtered. And San Francisco being a bit of a rebellious city, the citizens were up in arms about this and that's why a huge amount of resistance grew from the Altamont era. And uh, it's still ongoing, there's people doing research, trying to mitigate. There are good things happening, but the problem uh, is, is still, still there. There's a long way to go. But you should note that <coughs> in Altamont, if there were no wind farms, the pressure for, for property development was so great that it could have been the case that they would have, a developer could have acquired property in these areas and they would have cleared all the, uh, the shrub lands or whatever and you know maybe 80s 90s there would not have been any raptor country in here there would have been property development so thankfully the wind farms were there they were slaughtering birds but at least they were there to prevent property developers moving in. it's only one hour drive from san francisco and there are high the bart barrier rapid transit stations uh, quite close to altamont and so on but now because the wind farms are operating there is open country and now there's raptors and then there's the wind farms and now the issues still go on but uh, things are improving. Then there's another example is the Midwest. I take North Dakota because there's a lot of potential wind resources there and wind farms are getting developed. And if you look at the past eagle issues there, uh, eagles are being decimated, habitat destruction, degradation, illegal shooting, contamination, DDT problem. The eggs were cracking early. Uh, then the farming community uh, considered them as marauders. They preyed on chickens, lambs, and domestic, you know, the livestock. And then large raptors were shot because they were perceived as a threat. So the eagles were getting decimated. Now, today, obviously the eagles have now been protected and their populations rising, but now there's a priority to harness wind energy. There's wind farms in North Dakota. And now again, there's the wind farm eagle conflict and people are doing research into this thankfully the modern turbines are big and spaced far apart and so uh, it's not running into the early 1980s altamont kind of situation where there's a lot of small turbines guide towers where they're perching on and so on so the, the they don't have that kind of problem and uh, a lot of research is being done and uh, they're trying to impress upon the farming community that you have to remove roadkill, remove dead animals, whatever, because these guys will also, um, you know, they have the vulture kind of tendency as well. They will eat uh, carrion. They will not, not only hunt, but they will also see meal, opportunistic meals. So coming back to Altamont, one of the things, the good news is that they're repowering. They're putting larger turbines. So these large multi-megawatt turbines are replacing dozens of turbines in the range of 100 to 200, 300 kilowatt and so on. So they have space further apart. And they're also siting them with bird activity, avian activity in mind. So that's one of the things. Uh, and researchers, as this, I captured this headline, 
of the internet, researchers find ways for eagles and turbines. By the way, WTGE is wind turbine generator. So in, uh, in the industry, we refer to it as WTGEs. So they're talking about finding ways for eagles and the turbines to exist. I mean, that's a hazardous existence because one of the problems with these raptors is that they do, they have excellent vision, but when they're hunting, they're looking down. They're looking for prey. And so sometimes, I mean, especially when they're after prey, they're totally focused. They unfortunately start, uh, you know, encountering, hitting a turbine blade and then they break a wing or they get killed. That's one of the problems. Otherwise, their eyesight is excellent. Um, and there's still golden eagle deaths taking place, but uh, more and more research is being done because Altamont had a really bad start. I mean, in other words, they put wind farms, the worst types of wind farms in the worst possible location without any kind of study done. So you're starting from a horror story and now you're trying to extricate oneself from there. So a lot of lessons in terms of mitigation and so on are being learned on that. Again, as I said, proper siting and mitigation measures are key. Okay, and these are uh, avian experts who are making, uh, you know, observations. There, there's a lot of uh, research activity going on in these farms, trying to figure out their their patterns of flight and their breeding patterns, where they're nesting and all that. So. Uh, one of the key statements made by avian experts is that the, many of these birds will be saved with proper sighting and mitigation measures. In other words, you would identify certain zones where there's high avian activity and have setbacks from there. And so that would address part of the problem. And then in, in, in the Midwest, in some zones, there's now an issue you want to protect wildlife, you want to protect avian uh, you know, birds, precious birds, but then you also want to, you know, harness the energy, which is also, uh, which also makes a major uh, economic contribution. So now there's this conflict. So they have to, uh, they've come to a kind of uh, arrangement where they're going to give permits to wind project operators that they're going to have, we call them kill permits. Okay. But at least they have to then report on avian incidents record and basically what happens then is it's we refer to it regulate monitor enforce and mitigate so it's an ongoing problem it's the the issues are being reported avian uh, impact issues are being reported and one can sense find out there could be critical areas where the incidence of avian injury or death is higher and then you would have to go in there and figure out what needs to be done and so on. So at least now with this, there is uh, there's an evolution. I mean, before there was unreported, birds are getting killed, nobody knows how many, when, where, whatever, but now there's uh, close monitoring and there is the issue of punishment if wind farm operators are coming near the permit limit. So they're also conscious of it and they're also conscious about their image. So positive things are happening. Avian extreme sport continues. Did I miss a slide? No. I mean, I, I don't know about these birds. I, I don't understand their fascination with doing kamikaze things. I mean, you would go to zones where there are wind farms and okay, you don't hardly see any birds and then suddenly you have these flocks doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, this is pretty common. And thankfully, uh, smaller birds, they call it the, <laughs> there are birds that are called gangly, you know, who, who cannot react fast and, and uh, they have issues, especially with transmission lines. But smaller birds are able to take evasive action. Uh, the incidents of ducks, geese hitting turbines, I haven't seen too many from reports in the states. It's not to say that they're, they're not, it's not happening, but one always sees about issues with birds of prey. And I definitely know why that's because their ears, eyes are on the ground and they're chasing uh, prey and they're not observing what's ahead. And then of course, this is another issue with birds and airplanes. Birds are getting killed all the time. Uh, you don't hear much about it because the airplane engines can ingest a few birds uh, and it's designed for that and, and uh, 
uh, if they ingest too many, of course, then the plane is, has to, engine has to be uh, taken down. But this is a major issue uh, uh, that continues to take place. So now let's talk about what's happening with the industry. Turbines are getting bigger. They're huge now. I mean, this slide is, is um, um, even this is old now. Today, land-based turbines are in the range of two and a half megawatts and bigger, rotor diameters of 120, 130, 140 meter, hub heights of uh, 90 meter plus. So the good thing with that is that the turbines uh, their footprint on the ground is reduced because they have to be spaced further apart. Uh, and also, they are much more efficient in terms of energy capture. And if you see this one, as the turbines get bigger, there's one thing about the wind, in, wind turbine technology is that you cannot just, like I showed you a slide where they had planted turbines as if they were dropped them from seeds because they were really not thinking. They were not very scientific. They were just trying to pack wind turbines all over the place, but there is something called a wake effect. If you have flown in a plane, sometimes you, you find that if you're coming to land, the plane suddenly gets bounced, or maybe you're taking off. That's because the wake of a turbine uh, uh, airplane ahead was disturbing the plane behind. So the same with, with, with wind turbines, that you have to have a reasonable amount of space because otherwise the uh, energy capture, the performance of the, uh, the wind turbine downwind would be negated significantly. So typically in the industry, uh, we're talking of um, about eight rotor diameters in the predominant wind direction and four rotor diameters perpendicular to the predominant wind direction. So if you have a rotor of say 120 meters, you're talking of almost a kilometer apart in the predominant wind direction and maybe roughly half a kilometer apart <coughs> perpendicular to the predominant wind direction. So they are getting space further apart. So here is a picture of uh, a wind farm I would I call yesterday and then something which is today. Uh, or maybe a few years ago, you can see how they're spaced further apart. That's because they have to be uh, spaced such that the wake effect is not going to impact on the energy performance of the turbines downwind. Now, one of the favorable things with regards to Manor Island is this is um, what Avian advocacy groups don't figure out and they should figure out before they make you know comments and, and make demands on on siting of wind turbines is that there's there's a wind season and then there's a migratory bird season and then there's the nature of the winds and the way the birds which way the birds are flying so you can see that the migratory bird part obviously they're not precisely coming a certain way but they're generally coming They're generally coming in this direction from the landmass in India. And the winds are roughly in this direction. Now, first of all, during the wind season, that's the monsoon, there's no migratory birds. The migratory birds start arriving from November to March, which is then the northeast monsoon. There is a quantum of energy captured by the wind farms during the northeast monsoon, uh, but the major component is from the southwest monsoon. So, uh, one of the issues then is that the wind season is not matching the migratory bird season, which is a good thing. And the other is that because the winds are coming perpendicular to the direction the birds are going to fly in. So it's not the case that the birds are flying full face onto a turbine rotor because you really are, you know, really coming sideways because the rotor, if you look back, you see the turbine rotor faces the wind. If it's trying to capture the winds from this direction or if it's trying to capture the winds from that direction. So the rotors are facing and the birds are flying in this direction. So, so it's not correct to assume that the 
uh, the, the birds are flying full face. In other words, and then of course we know that the birds are not precisely coming from the northwestern direction and we know the winds are not precisely coming from the southwesterly direction. There's going to be some angular changes. But generally, if you say that there's maybe a 30 degree approach on, on the face, you know, you reduce the, 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 the zone of impact by 50% rather than full face, you're talking of an angled approach. And even this is, um, remember that this is not during the migratory bird season. There is a small component during the northeast monsoon and then, uh, you know, there is a risk that bird, migratory birds would be flying through operational turbines and uh, there could be a risk of birds colliding. But the other thing is assumption is that the, you know, people, uh, there's this belief that birds go one behind the other, not so. They, they fly in formation. That's because that's the most efficient way to fly. And so it's not the case that a whole line of birds are gonna run into a wind turbine. And by the way, uh, birds do have good sighting. So um, there's another measure one can take is to mark the turbines so that, uh, oh, I need to comment on this. I will come to the marking of the turbines, but here's, here's a slide by, uh, put out, here's something that was put out by an avian advocacy, advocacy group, which really is, um, it's not a credible uh, representation because it's implying that that's the CB line of turbines and all the migratory birds are gonna go all the way down, you know, that way. And so, and, and there are avian death traps which, uh, you know, this is emotive language. It's not very scientific. And uh, one should, you know, refrain from using terms like this. Um, and if you can compare Mana wind farms and the avian collision risk, uh, it's unlike Altamont or the Midwest. Conditions are not comparable. Uh, Altamont and Midwest, the ground is rich with rodents, rabbits, squirrels, and mice, etc. Uh, raptor presence is high. In Altamont, there's dense fog, which also contributes to the problem. And in these zones, the human presence is low. It's rolling hills or vast farmlands. And I think mana is not quite that way. And the collision risk is low in mana because the low uh, due to the seasonal uh, characteristics of the wind and the migratory birds. And then there has to be adequate setback from the wetlands because the wetland area is where the birds, birds congregate and their flight patterns in the wetland area are haphazard and unpredictable. And so obviously having wind turbines close to the wetland would not be a good idea. Now, um, in the EIA, there were uh, a lot of work done and there were people, experts brought into model. It's very hard to model a scenario of, of birds flying in and a wind farm with, with a certain spread and to try to determine the, uh, the extent of bird impact and so on. Because in the end, you have to make many, many assumptions and uh, the assumptions uh, have been simplified and it's not optimal to manner because of the seasonal mismatch and the approach interpretation because in, in, the, in the study uh, they were saying if it was full face there's a certain you know I, I can't spend time putting graphics on screen but uh, if it's full face rotor the bird passes through there's only a a limited time of you know impact time uh, zone time but if it's angled they're saying that they would go from here to here there's more time in the zone of impact which i don't agree because basically for me it's full face if this is a um, an area you're going to come in for impact and if it's angled then the area is reduced i mean and that's i think a better assumption but anyway these are uh, assumptions made in the in the avian collision risk modeling uh, the migratory path of birds is quite, is predictable, but the agi what I call agitated flight, you may have seen in wetlands, you have birds peacefully foraging, whatever they're in the water, and then suddenly, I don't know, for some reason, they take off and they circle around and then they land. And now that's very hard to model or predict. And if you have 
impediments like turbines or transmission lines in the vicinity, you're going to have uh, collision events taking place. Uh, for MENA, uh, I mean Lalit, who's the CEB project manager, he's here. He's saying that they're talking about using radar at MENA to uh, monitor migratory birds. I really don't think it's necessary because of the, uh, you know, the seasonal mismatch between migrating birds and uh, the wind season. Um, and the other thing is that I think visual markers would be useful on turbines because the birds do are able to see and something in future would take place is what are called shrill emitters you could have you know now today camera technology is growing you have GoPro cameras you could have a camera on a turbine it's monitored in the control room and if you see presence of birds near a turbine you could trigger a shrill that would birds can hear uh, you know you should know that uh, you can chase them away so there are things to be done and uh, you know, technology is evolving, and these matters there can be there are can be me measures taken to mitigate issues of bird collision. Um, one of the other problems is I'm not sure. Uh, I know there are uh, there's the there's eagle that does fishing off there, right? There's the eagle, and then there's peregrine falcon also. The peregrine falcon is someone that dives and catches other birds in flight, but I don't think it's raptor country like in Altamont or Dakota or the Midwest. So, but the thing is raptor flights are unpredictable because they don't just go from A to B, they're hovering and they're looking down and, and uh, that, that is an issue. So visual effects, I mean birds can see and there, there are, there's records, there's evidence that birds evade things ahead because they're looking ahead. And uh, this turbine, this is basically done for aviation warning, but but you can also maybe put put stuff in there to to uh, give a visual impact to birds so that they can take evasive action. And uh, also, I believe that uh, the aviation authority requires that turbines have aviation hazard warning lights. They do have a what is called a, a, a strobe light in the day and a red blinker at night. So all these things are. Um, uh, items that can deter birds from flying straight through into a turbine. Now, Lali just went away. I think he knew I was going to talk about the transmission line. Now, there's currently, there's a plan, the, the proposal is to run a high voltage 220 kV transmission line across Waikalai Bird Sanctuary. And I think that's uh, not a good idea at all because you're going right through the middle of the wetlands. And uh, these flocks in the vicinity of wet, wetlands, because as I said, they are, I call it, for, for lack of a better word, I call it agitated flight, because they suddenly take off and they circle and then they land and they're in big groups. And uh, these visual things won't work because the birds are together and maybe the birds in front would see, but the others wouldn't. So this is a problem, and I think this, it's not a, not a good idea to have an overhead transmission system crossing this bird sanctuary. And I refer to what are called gangly birds. These are birds that are clumsy. I mean, you see them in flight, uh, and, and in the report they talk of high wing loading. In other words, they're not birds that can take evasive action like a little bird. You know, it's like a, if you compare it to airplanes it's like a lumbering cargo aircraft compared to a fighter jet kind of so these birds are vulnerable to things like transmission lines in fact uh, bird large they call it so the UNDP have a study which is ongoing soaring birds these are these large birds them impacting on transmission lines that's a big issue there's a major study it's an ongoing study so that's something that needs to be addressed. And here's the Vankalai Sanctuary and that's the proposed transmission line and I think that this there's seven and a half kilometers of transmission. I firmly believe that this should be going underground because this is a very bad idea. And uh, in my next slide I will tell you that, okay, I will come to that. So here's, this is in Vankalai area. I got this off the internet. Actually, the site, the website is there. 
So you can imagine if these guys are on an agitated flight routine and then they come into land, they're going to run through the transmission line and the risk of collision is going to be pretty high. Okay. And here's an incident that happened last year in India and uh, this is December 12th. 18 flamingos were killed and then now there's reports that there's been more obviously that there's a lot unlike Sri Lanka there's I think in, in, in Sri Lanka there's much more uh, concern about fauna and flora and there's more awareness of what's going on and I think in India it's a vast country there's transmission lines going all over I'm sure there's a lot more carnage than what we follow in the news because this is when there's large amounts of birds getting hit. I'm sure there's ones and twos getting killed regularly, which are unreported. So these large birds are quite vulnerable and they do tend to collide with transmission lines. Here's a UNDP, it's called Migratory Soaring Birds Project. This is a, this is a shot in Africa and I think this is, uh, this is a common phenomenon. That's why they're doing a study try to figure out how to address and I think if they are in a path where they're crossing over I think then line markers would, would be effective because they are not doing what I call the agitated flight they're just going right through so maybe that might work or maybe they also have things that shimmer and they give a different visual effect which also deters birds so maybe that may work now the other thing what was not even covered in the EIA were, was this is a serious operational issue. This is a cost, you know, it's operation and maintenance issue. High voltage lines suffer acute operational loss and assume growing liability risk due to bird strikes and streamers. Streamers, that's a very civilized word for, for what all creatures do naturally. You'll see it's called poop, bird poop cripples power lines and you can see why because these large birds look at that so you can imagine they they fly over transmissions and that if they bridge to if they're flying and if they bridge to transmission lines it arcs and if they perch and then they do their thing it falls on the insulator and drips down it creates chaos it, it's a huge problem I couldn't get I couldn't capture a flamingo on flight doing this but you can see how I mean this is a major major issue and so why build a piece of infrastructure that's going to be there for 25 years and you're going to have all these operational maintenance issues and the bird population I mean the way Sri Lanka is going there's more and more uh, you know appreciation of nature on and floor. I mean the bird population will increase and so you're not going to have a piece of infrastructure that's going across and you're going to have this bird collision issue which should you know prevent that being done overhead it go underground and then from an operator's point of view the maintenance problems you have is also an economic issue so this argument that overhead is cheaper than underground for me is not valid because uh, today underground cabling prices are coming down because there's a demand for underground cabling because they're they are increasing urban uh, transmission distribution infrastructure and then the wind industry is making demands on buried cable offshore and even onshore so I think uh, they will have to there has to be uh, that part I think even advocacy groups would make a stand on the transmission that crosses Vankalai that has to be arranged underground and then there was also in the EIA there was this um, claim that well there's historic right of way there's a railway line going through and there's a 33 kV transmission line so we have established the historic right of way and therefore we can build the 220 kV high voltage that's not valid because in the end society start appreciating these precious assets like fauna and flora you know and we can't just give uh, in fact, I would think the 33 kV should be buried as well. There should not be. And then there's the aesthetics issue. People are coming to take photographs, pictures, and the last thing they want to see is 
a huge flock of birds and a transmission line out there. I mean, we are doing tourism on that basis. So there's a lot of factors that make the case for burying the transmission line that uh, goes through the sanctuary. Now, <clears throat> another thing you need to know is that there are wind farms near wetlands. I mean, uh, here's a picture uh, of one. Uh, I don't know where this came from. And uh, I think I've, some of these slides have shown before at presentations here, uh, you know, because in the end, development of renewable energy is important, but also the avian issue is also important. So somehow, I guess the studies they did here would, uh, you know, maybe they came to the conclusion that uh, avian collision risk is low and the bird kills. Remember, we're not talking about zero bird kills here. I mean, it's unfortunate fact of life that birds are going to hit turbines and get killed. The issue is, are we negating the bird population? Okay. And then the other is that also it's unpalatable to have, I mean, I don't think it's pleasant that all of us appreciate wildlife and so on. We don't like these kinds of incidents taking place. So we must take steps to mitigate this. Now, here's a, this is a recent project, maybe I think not quite recent. This came commercial about over five years ago, or maybe eight years ago. This is in Texas. It's a protected wildlife. These extensive studies were conducted. This is wetlands um, to minimize environmental impact on birds and wildlife in wetlands. So yeah, great, they did studies and everyone was happy that the studies were done and measures taken to mitigate. And then bird hunting season. So this is Buffin Bay, the same bay where the, all these extensive studies are done, but it's a primary prime bird hunting season. So you talk of this is the most important waterfowl wintering area in Central Flyway and there's a hunting season. So again, what they say is that Okay, hunting and recreation is a U.S. pastime and that's encouraged because what they're saying is it does not negate the avian population. So they do this, they do a lot of environmental stuff to protect the, the conditions there so the food chain is not compromised so that the birds are attracted and so on. And this is reality, okay. And then I want to show you this slide. And I asked the question, will this be what manna is going to look like? But definitely not, because we moved on from things like this. And I suspect, this is in Sardinia, southern Italy. And I suspect what happened here was that before, one, before the wind industry came, uh, there must have been, these are flamingos, there must have been bird life, wetland bird life here. But then the appreciation level was not that great. They opened an industrial park and the transmission line came through to provide power to the industrial facilities. And then sometime later, they had self-generation. They started developing wind power. But in the meantime, the European Union rules about cleaning, uh, you know, effluent discharge, controlling that, cleaning the waterways and so on required, you know, then it re-established the food chain and then the birds started returning. So now you have this situation, you know, where you have a transmission line, 220 kV, wind farms, and it's an industrial facility. But no worries, I don't think manna is going to be that. Uh, so concluding, meeting the growing electric power demand presents challenging problems in Sri Lanka. The fossil fuel option is unpalatable and it's an interim choice. Uh, wind is a viable option in the power mix. Even issues are significant. We've got to take steps to mitigate. Uh, and then Sri Lanka is a small island. There are land demand issues. Multiple users wanting land. I mean, this thing of, you see this even a few months ago, I saw a photo. Money came from the Middle East. They cleared jungles adjoining Vilpattu and for building houses. So, we. While at the end of the day, we have to care, take care of the residents here, but this casual of clearing of forests is, should not be encouraged because I think in the end, the forest is like the breathing, that's our lungs, you know, and that's very important. So 
jungle clearing land to, uh, for land allocation settlers. This is political considerations are prominent in this kind of thing. Then wind farms have a significant spread, but the spread that can be negated because wind farms, the, uh, the land is subject to dual use. Wind farms and agriculture, wind farms, livestock, whatever. So it's not really denying other productive activity on the land. And then I also noted in the EIA studies, there were public hearings, the public, the locals were not too happy with the sanctuary in Vankalai because it was impacting their lifestyle and their meager economic means and so on because there were certain rules by wildlife and so on. So these are sensitive issues that, you know, need to be uh, handled. And another thing that was missing in the EIA is the transportation logistics because if you're going to build these large wind farms, there's a lot of stuff. Every, every large turbine, like a two, two and a half megawatt turbine, needs about seven heavy truck trailer loads. So if you're going to build, do a, you know, 100 turbine project, that's a lot of truck and they, they get delivered rapidly. And then there has to be a port where the stuff is delivered and then truck to site. So I, I didn't see that being mentioned in the EIA. And then finally, I just want to make my pitch because this, this argument about coal, I mean, at the end of the day, I can understand the CEB planners dilemma because in the end they got to meet the power demand and it's it's I had a chat I was talking to Dr. Anil Cabral here mentioning that in the end uh, they are familiar with a certain routine and uh, it's hard for them to look at an alternative routine but the, the, but the issues are clear because in the end there is going to be an environmental impact there is also going to be an economic impact because in the end, the carbon footprint is going to punish us because the goods we export will be taxed. That's going to happen. But more than that, we must, the emissions issue, we're not sure what, what happens with, if, if there was a coal plant also in Sanpur, you can imagine that during the southwest monsoon, the emissions get blown across the island and then the rains bring it down. And the same with the northeast monsoon. And so you're talking of uh, the acidity uh, changing in, in the ground and that could have an impact. Uh, maybe the fertility of the land is impacted, then you have to start putting fertilizer or, you know, soil corrective stuff, which is expensive. So we're, we're, we're caught in a, tra a trap there, economic trap, and then we don't know what it's going to do with the fauna and flora. So there are issues with regards to having this coal option. You know, unfortunately, if, if if they started from the beginning, they would have built the coal plant here, so the emissions would be going right across, but that didn't happen. We would then only face issues like fuel price and currency risk and so on. Okay, I think I'm done. That's another wetland side. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> uh, how many a avian advocacy groups people are here? I see Ranil here. Where's your friends? Where? But you go on the internet, there's a lot of material on the internet. Question? Sorry. <laughs> yes? What is the alternative velocity of a turbine uh, You're getting very technical, it's very high, it'll chop a bird in two easily, it's very high. It's not, it's not supersonic, but it's a high tip speed. Okay? It's it's going at 14 rpm, but that doesn't that's very deceptive. Sorry, because, no, that's a roll rpm, but the tip speed is very high. It may turn slower, but the tip is way out there. It, I mean, the bird, if the bird even flies close to the, the 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 blade, even if it doesn't hit it, the wake effect will break a bird's wing. Okay, so. Actually, one day I was standing close to the, the U.S. Line, the next one, it just came 29. Every five minutes, I saw a portrait of wind turbines, the three rotors and the pieces of the tower being driven down. I was wondering, one day will birds ever fly? No, I am. You're being. You see, <laughs> uh, birds will fly. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. You see, with all the carnage going on in Altamont Pass, which was a horror story for wind industry avian because that, that's a place where they started putting turbines without any thought for environmental impact, okay? 
and then the public consciousness grew. They were looking at all these raptors getting decimated by these hundreds of turbines, 100 kilowatt, 200 kilowatt. So they are now repowering, they are putting larger turbines, they are spaced further apart. So the birds are not, I mean birds are getting killed even today because it's had a horror story start. But the, but the measures are being taken to mitigate. So with, with larger turbines, the probability of birds hitting is, is reduced significantly. You, you can't compare countries like USA or India, which countries like Sri Lanka, they are a small island. And Nana, is a major migratory birds. So, we have been talking about a lot of mitigation measures that can be taken. But why, why do you land this? Why do you recommend that we should land this thing in Nana and not any other things? Because, as I told you in that slide, um, the, uh, that Mana Island is unique. First of all, the first thing is that I explained to you there was. Uh, a seasonal mismatch in the sense that the uh, go to this slide uh, what's going on here sorry bear with me Um, there's a wind season and there's a migratory bird season. They're not, what well, the major wind season is. Why manna? Huh? Why manna? Well, why manna is because, as I explained, um, it's a resource rich area. It's a wind resource rich area. And it's unique because it's aligned perpendicular to the winds. And what happens is that the winds come over, hit the land mass, and then it hits an open stretch of water that allows the winds to, without any back pressure, to clear away. And so that's why the resource is, is very good there. But in 2003, in Ariel, with the Sri Lanka wind farm analysis and site selection assistance, and uh, they have recommended various signs and talked about taking number one. So where, where was Kalpitya. it? Kalpitya, yes, yeah. for the down south, yes. Ambevela. Yes, Ambevela. Yeah. And then Mana. And then Mana. Okay, so um, uh, let me. The report, uh, yes, yes, I'm aware of this. Uh, let me so explain. Why put this when there are other places? Because um, let me go to that wind map. Something is okay. There's excellent wind resources here, okay, on the ridge lines, but there's a huge transportation challenge. The technology, the wind turbines are huge. You can't, you have a major, major problem getting stuff to these areas. Now, you talk, there was a study done, so this is the Amberwell area, I mean the ridge, we all know about the ridge line issues, you know, the, the resource is you know, great resource. Then, Kalpitya area, yes, the wind resources are good, but not as good as Mana, because, because Mana, as I told, explained to you, the, the characteristics are such with the waterways on either side. And believe me, this is a huge offshore area here. The industry is going to come here. This is going. To, this is a major wind resource area. And then your concern, as I said, there's a seasonal mismatch. The migratory bird season does not match the major the wind season. Number one, number two, even in the minor component, the northeast monsoon, the birds. I mean, the 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 the, the birds are flying where. I mean, they're not flying full rotor face. They're flying almost off on site, kind of. So they can one can take. Mitigation measures in terms of color indication, coding, whatever, to address that issue. 
it can easily be handled. And also, you, you know, technology is growing. You could have cameras, you know, you know what a GoPro camera is. I mean, there's cameras for everything today. They will put cameras on little birds to track where they're going. And you have a camera and then you have a central monitoring thing. And if you see bird activity, you can use a shrieker to scare them off or you can shut a turbine. There's a lot of things one can do. In the end, we need green energy. These are our resources. I mean, maybe in 20 years time, 30 years time, I think solar would dominate and maybe they'll decommission wind. I don't know, there'll be solar and storage. But in the interim, in the next, you know, years, decade and two decades, we need to harness wind energy. I have a question. The transmission line across the sector area is about seven and a half kilometers. Yeah. What would be the cost to, what would be the incremental cost of building this section? You know, the old, it's like, I think what I saw is like 50% more in current rates, but the costs are coming down. And also you have to consider the operational issue, 20, 25 year life. And this bird streamer issue is a serious issue. You see, I mean, why, I mean, in the end, you're going to subject this line to all this avian activity, collision and the bird streamer issue. So, I mean, you know, you know, that, that is something that has to be factored in. I think that 50% gives you a bigger impression than what the reality. We consider the potential of 400 megawatts of wind. Right. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but here's the problem. The thing is that they have to build the infrastructure to handle the 400 megawatt plus. Yeah, so. take total cost, incremental cost of the overall program. Exactly, exactly. Sure, but I think that's where, you know, avian groups, they have a legitimate issue here and I would even support the fact that you've got to bury it because it's a big no-go to have a 220 kV transmission going through a wetland zone that's a Ramsar site. I mean, it's, it can't do, no way. I don't know about where I get this 150 megawatts because CB no, no, that's the first phase, 100 megawatt first phase. And let me, since you raised this question, let me tell you, you they've talked about 375 megawatts. Okay, but you can never make a, something static like that because what is happening with the industry is that the turbines, the technology is evolving. You have the platform, they're having wider rotor sweeps. So as you start building more projects, say 100 megawatts first, and you start building more projects, what is happening is that they're capturing more energy and the supply chain, all the components that come into the turbine, the costs are coming down. And what they're doing is that they had a 2.5 or 3 megawatt platform initially, the next model would be a 3.2 megawatt and so on. So they're now putting in more power as well. So suddenly you may start on the base of 375, but maybe in five years time, you can pack a lot more than that. And they should pay heed to that when they plan this thing, they should be aware that there's a lot more one could capture in, on this island. You are referring to the EIA report? Yes. The EIA report? Yes. Right. The EIA report was never on the discussion here. Uh, and uh, the IED done by the CDA. The CDA. And uh, also, you are talking about the underground power line. Uh, already, the uh, bidding is even completed, and uh, it's a matter of awarding the contract for the transmission line. So, how, how can you just work this? Um, <laughs> I live abroad, I'm just giving you a point of view. I yeah, mean, I they may have done whatever. Because, uh, Sorry? According to the ADP, I think already the bidding was completed for the power line, and they're using the whole. Uh, well, I, I would think that, that avian advocacy groups should contact the ADB and tell them, look, you need to retract on this because it's a serious matter. This is a stand, we have to make a stand, you know. So this is, I think it's a serious issue. It's, 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 not, to, to, it's not to the national benefit to have a transmission line that's negating a, 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 an asset that is drawing people because of its nature and it's also burdening the system because these lines would have high maintenance over, over the 20-25 year lifetime. 
And they never covered this in the EIA, this bird streamer issue. So that's something, you know, they need to Yeah, I, I think this this should, this has to go underground. Sure. Sorry. For this project, for this project, we have to employ the gas system to reduce the water pollution. The radar, radar. Yeah. But you told that uh, you firmly told that it is uh, not necessary. And uh, can you explain why? You see, I, I don't think it's necessary because. The predominant the uh, wind season is uh, is the southwest monsoon, right? There's no migratory birds then. I mean, this is to this is to deal with migratory birds, not the endemic birds who are flying all low. I mean, there's not such a large bird volume. It's a migratory bird issue because they're coming in large flocks over this area, so they are migrating uh, what December to March, kind of in and out. I mean, that's the, the wind season is a southwest monsoon, so it's a non-issue. So why, why, why I mean, you sh CB is conceding because they're getting pressure from avian people saying, oh, you've got to have this bird monitoring because in Spain they're monitoring bird flocks with radar. Yeah, sure. But, but you've got to apply something when it, when it is justified. I mean, what is the justification of uh, having a radar system? Because there's a mis seasonal mismatch. And then you have the minor component, the northeast monsoon, which is you know, November, December, January, maybe, and then there's, you know, the birds exiting again. It's the other redeeming factor is that, that the birds are not going full face against the turbines. The turbines are facing the wind and the birds are going that way. And then the turbines are spaced far apart. They're almost like a kilometer apart. So maybe a bird or two over the season could hit unfortunately, but at the end of the day, there's large gaps between the turbines. So these are factors one has to take into account. We're not trying to say we're going to, there's going to be zero bird kill. Unfortunately, birds are getting killed all the time. There's carnage when these migratory birds come through to, to Sri Lanka. They get, uh, I was, because of this study I was researching, they get slaughtered in Basra. Basra has marshlands. It's a wetland area. I mean, people eat flamingo meat there. Then they fly over Pakistan, there's bird hunting season. I don't think they hunt flamingos, but they hunt mallards and ducks and all kinds of migratory birds. I think, I'm sure in India, these large birds are getting slaughtered due to transmission lines. So, I mean, we should, you know, and the other thing you need to understand is that when a bird hits a turbine, it's a high, high visibility issue, you know, because you see a bird and it hit a turbine. But there are death by stealth, fossil fuels, poison the ground, poison waterways, and bird, I mean, avian life is impacted significantly, a lot more. So, you know, these are issues, you've got to have a balanced viewpoint here. I have no idea, that's where, you know, the, I think, you know, avian advocacy groups, you guys should, you know, it's never too late, I mean, if you're going, you know, you bought a ticket and you're going in a vehicle and you could go down the cliff. You can't say, we'll plan the trip now. You can't change. I mean, there, it's, I don't think it's valid. This is, uh, I think this is national interest issue. It's never too late. I still have a question about the site selection. Uh, you know, the Nadia report says about initial screening for land Yes. Uh, for an initial land suitability screening to eliminate sites where wind turbines are cannot or should not be installed. Factors that would eliminate the site from concentration include national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, or other areas where development is prohibited, migration routes or migratory bird species, areas uh, with high concentration of rare and endangered birds under the NRA report. So this no, no, but I mean, this NREL was done in 2003, 2004, yeah. okay? I mean, we have a major problem here. 
we need to go green on our power sector. You understand? We have. Okay, then, in 2003, Amarela is the road system, the road system that developed considered bricks in 2003. So, why can't you take the. Uh, don't, don't tell me. I'm, I'm telling you that no, it's a. You said that that's a problem. Maybe equipment that has to be carried. But the road system that came. I, I think, uh, well, anyway, it's a big problem. Transportation is a huge issue. Huh? Yeah, exactly. It's a big problem. Sorry? Is there what? Yeah. Of course, of course. I mean, the cooler they are, the denser it is, and more you get more energy. Of course, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, mean, I should, uh, if I go back to. You know, all the north, north, the northwestern and north, northern part of Sri Lanka is wind country. Uh, if I may go there, I mean that's where this computer is annoying me. See, this is all all wind country here. You know the thing. I will tell you something. All these we, you know, we're all concerned about wildlife, fauna and flora and so on. You know, I've asked, my brother was in the army, he's been in war also, and I've been trying to get information. You know, there's Chundikulam Bird Sanctuary here, okay? There were over 25 years of horrendous war. Mortar, artillery, infantry, you name it. Horrendous battles around here. It would be interesting, the birds haven't gone away. They're there now. Priyanti Fernando, who's who's you know a friend of mine, she made the point. Oh, but never mind the war. There were no people, so that's why they they put up with the explosions and so on. But there was no human activity. You see, the tragedy is that at the end of the day, our footprint is a negative one. If we could leave Sri Lanka and come back a hundred years later, it would be a magnificent place. I mean, that's the reality. But we have to live here, and our impact is a negative one. So now we have a situation where we ha we need to harness energy to generate electricity, and we can't, you know, we depend on imported fuel because there are various factors that burden us, you know, economic and environmental and so on. And then we have indigenous resources, renewable resources. We have to harness it, and we got to learn to deal with the avian, you know, the fauna and flora issues. My last question. <laughs> You know, CV reduced the sites, number of sites, I think, down to 39 or 36 Turbines? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't understand why. The, you see, this is one of the problems that... No, can I ask you my question? Now, you said, uh, and they have reduced the power sector, they have reduced the power generation also by the time around the world. You went to the figure of 400. Well, how are you proposing that's the second place. Where is this going to be? Okay. Is it in one of the islands? All over Manor Island. No. You think Manor Island? Yes. Not the yes. Islands, uh, All over Manor Island. I mean, I have, um, I have run numbers. You, you can consider 50% of Manor Island and, and, and develop 400 megawatts. I mean, one of the issues is that people, one of the tendencies in Sri Lanka is they all start squatting on land now and then you won't have, that's why that zone, that island should be zoned as a wind, wind energy zone and then they would identify areas, archaeolo you know, resident, community, archaeological, whatever, but then the area must be zoned for wind, wind power development. When you say Manai is referring to the island, India, no, I'm referring to this, 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 this island here, this, this piece here. That's an island, and I don't understand why. I guess early days, see, we were told by the avian lobby that you can't put turbines here because that's where the migratory birds are 
could have come through. But then again, what I'm saying is it's a non-issue because when they are migrating, it's off wind season. So why did they concede? They should have made, if I put a lighthouse here, they would not have objected, right? So when the turbines are going to be like a lighthouse. So I don't understand why they, you know. They are technology coming up. Technology without I, I, I'm not a genius. I can haven't figured that out. Yet. I have no idea. I mean, I'm. Sorry. No, no. But you see, I mean, if you want to get into that, you know, in the 1980s, in the USA, all kinds of technologies were tried out. Okay, and it's called the survival of the fittest. So today, the fittest are surviving and evolving. So it's no point going back to, you know, that era. Sure. No, I, I have no information. All I'm saying is that when I was preparing for this, I reviewed the EIA and I also reviewed background information. And one of the things I discovered was that when you have large avian activity around, there was power plants where there were transmission lines and, and you know, uh, you know, waterways where birds reside. They had this huge maintenance problem with these birds. They call it bird streamers. And and this Wankalai issue is a classic because it's, it's going right through the middle and there's this large bird population. And you have this scenario of agitated flight where they suddenly take off, they do rounds and they land, they collide and then they do their streamer thing. I mean, so there are all kinds of issues with it. Uh, you told me that uh, Mona and the island will be going for a week in uh, this one. So, for my knowledge that half of the Mona population lives in the island. Yes. So, what will happen to them? Uh, I just said that uh, one, one is looking at, uh, you said utilizing 50% of the land, quantum of land in Mana would allow you to harness 400 megawatts, 50%. And remember, and even on that 50%, when you site turbines, that land will be subject to dual use. If there's any agriculture activity, any palm, you know, whatever, palm plantations or whatever. So you're not denying usage of the land. And so the turbine footprint on the land is minimal. Yeah, that uh, question, that question, uh, the you're talking about this coast here? Yeah. Yeah, tourists are, I don't think tourists are coming to enjoy the coast. Tourists are coming really to for the no, road side. Uh, yeah, I have a from Mana, same place, same location. Uh, that's the one uh, uh, that uh, Although the Chinese are putting up a large hotel there, very close to the sea, the wind winds are coming. Yeah. Where? On the coast here? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'll tell you one thing. Yeah, I was, the other one is, yeah, at least. The second one is, I think that. Uh, I spoke that uh, AD guy and I have gone through that uh, uh, not in the depth uh, in the bath of the year before it has not done a property. And uh, most of us from the Mana residents are unaware that uh, uh, this project, even the residents are in hotels are the property. Uh, unfortunately, it is going through my land as well. You are from Mana? I am from Mana from okay, Kaysari. Okay. You see, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think the EIA had a public consultation process. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm not involved with this activity. Huh? There was several uh, public consultation programs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, came, uh, the came, uh, 
people from the area came. Like, no, I can challenge with him. I can challenge the CEB. There's no proper construction was done. I, I, I have given, in fact, I wrote a few mails uh, to the uh, ANP also, saying that one. Because it, it seems, uh, I have a 50 acres of land that uh, 229 is going in, 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 uh, through my land. So when I ask that one, uh, that the guys are not in the question, they can answer. Right? But in the meantime, as engine, I don't know the block that developed and so on. And that's not this one. I mean, so I can challenge any CEP that they are not consulted resident this property. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I'm. Entire I'm one last century, no, I'm not here to, I mean, I'm sorry about your, your situation, you need to address that. But in, since you're from Mana, I can tell you, I was in Mana last year, this whole coast is heavily polluted. All leftover fishing nets, polystyrene, I mean, it's a filthy, filthy beach. So it's severely degraded environmentally, and that's a huge threat to bird life. So you should tell your people that that's a big problem. Yeah. Actually, that uh, like it is not the only uh, people, but then the main thing people should be educated the first. Second one, the law enforcing uh, uh, body also should be do their job properly. Say even that uh, if you see in Colombo, so those who are driving the value that throwing the uh, garbage out of the gate, so this one. So uh, you are the known, educated, and uh, professional people are doing that uh, this sort of thing. So the poor Mana people who have been facing uh, no, I understand. the last 30 years of uh, war. So you have to do the proper education for them. As engineers and lawyers, I don't deny. Okay. I don't know. People are not under their own the traditional fishing, and they are doing. At the moment, there are 18 prohibited fishing nets in Mana. Mana is a very important fishing nets. 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 Mana is a very important Mm. I think uh, uh, the one thing is even the forum for uh, I mean we are discussing the birds uh, mm. the trees. Yes. But for him actually he is that from the market recently came. So to contract us as the public consultation is going on. Ongoing. So, it was Ongoing. Going. So, so so I mean there is no point of telling that we are listening at ADP for about two weeks back. So, I will one more thing. In my class, I have another letter. I have a letter. I have a letter. I have a letter. But I am not, uh, this is not the forum for that. You are going to say, Mr. Robert Peary. Mr. Robert Peary, now uh, we have been published. We can go to the general manager and ask who is the project director. Please call us. And today we will meet you. And one of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, we did put each other out. The game took her out. We will discuss it. Yeah, I'm not going to answer. Huh? That's what I'm saying. No. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, you can meet the other people. I I made that local resident here. Right, ask me. Then I made that, uh, that, uh, no, no. I made the proposal. I made the proposal. Now, CB is a new big red. Yeah, CB is a new organization. The project team is completely separate, and the distribution team is completely separate. Those who are there, they are doing the electric supply. I know that. Now, now the project team, most of people are here to be. Are they are they coming? Are they from our team? So we will tackle it. Are you free? Come on, let's go to the forum. Sure. ครับอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ่าอ
the cost of three times. You're talking seven and a half, seven and a half kilometers, and you're talking the impact over 30 years, 25, 30 years. And there are other issues that are huge on this. You see? That's something you gotta, I mean, when you bury a cable, there's no root issue, right? You can bury it. There's no root issue. You go, you can bury, put it even underwater, you can bury it underwater too. Can you go through the normal height? Go through the what? I cannot uh, answer that, but let me go to that map. And one other thing, there are two projects here. Two projects? The branch and line project is different. And the input is another one. So, I accept that they are both. No, 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 no,
The IEA seems to be a the IEA seems to be a way of shortcutting to the EIA and to kind of justify the project. The IE is done. Sometimes on smaller projects, you don't ask for a full fledged EIA, yeah, you just have IT. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Are we done? One, one thing I just want to say, I am seeing someone from CPP. There are 125 megawatts that has already developed by private sector. Yes. And nobody was vulnerable. I mean, no, no type of a like aggression for I mean, working out mean, there. They do whatever you want. I mean, we don't have that particular uh, free hand for the Indian to do that. No, but they are, don't forget, these are scattered. I mean, some are in Putlam area and some in. I think the, the big uh, the thing was here, there was a Ramsar site, wetlands, and then there was a migratory bird park issue. So, you know, but that's fine. But in, in the issues can be faced, analyzed, and addressed. That's not a. The thing is, even though there is a. More than the resource potential. That is the resource potential. Yes. So that's why I think yeah. it's important to zone this area as a wind energy zone. And then allocate, that's why it took only 50%. I was saying in the end, you would have to allocate for, for residential, for agro, for tourists or whatever. There's a Navy base in the northern tip. There's an Army base in the south. I mean, there's a lot of land that's being occupied or will be occupied. But I, I said 400 megawatts on the basis of 50% of the land. You see? Now, that CEA, for whatever reason, has said this only E, should not be the, should not be accepted in the long-term interest of the country right. as a country. Right, absolutely. I don't think it's too late even to now do a proper EIA. Yeah. Right? Because taking all what you have considered, what this gentleman said, all that, because that is going to impact on the possibility of uh, uh, dividend the rest of the Sure, country. absolutely. So, we should proceed it because huh. we are not aware if somebody Right side and I tell you, my vote on it, that is not possible. CA can't do that. Because it's only 25 megawatts, so my vote is with the IEA, provided there are no sensitive areas closed by others. I don't know, they have the indicator. CA has already done it, but the ADP has reduced to public without the area. That is very correct. So I think uh, I think the avian advocacy group should meet with the ADB and highlight this thing because I don't think ADB, I don't think the CEB want to be, you don't want a negative on a on a wind project, surely. The CEB is interested to do it properly so that there are no ongoing issues coming up.
See, I think the major comfort zone for you is uh, what I told you about the seasonal mismatch, which is a positive thing, right? Because the major, the wind season is in the monsoon and the migratory bird season is, you know, between like November, December to, to March kind of. And then the other comfort zone is that the orientation of the turbines is also, it's not full face on the migratory bird part. So that also has a mitigatory effect. So these you have to take into account. And then the third is that these are large rotor diameter, they're spaced <laughs> further apart. So we're migrating through turbines that are spaced about a, one, about a kilometer apart. You see, so these are factors that, that are positive in nature. You know, it's not like these birds are coming in line and running into full face turbines one after the other. That's not the case at all. See, I think the, the other thing that uh, we must understand and that sometimes people don't tend to understand is that uh, the, 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 if the bird migration paths are affected very badly here, it is not just the mana that is going to have the problem. And it's not, not just Mankala that is going to have a problem, right? It's going to be the birds all over the country of Sri Lanka. So the, you can, we can talk about the entire avian uh, ornithological uh, uh, thing just collapsing if it if they don't get through. It will come to a complete zero. Yeah, but what, what I mean the thing okay, again I'm not an avian expert, but the carnage that went on in Chundikulam, the, the war. I mean the birds are bad I mean they were there right through the war too. I mean they're they're pretty resilient. And and again, again I'm not an avian expert, but these people these birds run through carnage when they migrate. Uh, yeah, but what happened was uh, the Chundikulam birds, they came through, uh, through Mana and went to Chundikulam. But uh, there weren't barriers. You see, uh, a war, bombs or 
shots or whatever were barriers. Just to, to so you're considering a wind farm as a barrier? I mean, there. <laughs> well, it's a permanent structure. Anyway, when you're tampering with nature, you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows where. Now, when you move all the way, when we were diving in the Indian Ocean, when we were 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 in the Indian Ocean, the water went into the reservoir in Mamanda. And it captures the salinity or disturbs the salinity of the water there. And today, there are no flamingos going to Kundal. Otherwise, thousands of flamingos used to fly to Kundal. So that's a stop. So that's a simple change. But I think it's not that possible. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, if you look at uh, wind farms near wetlands in other parts of the world, uh, wind farms haven't deterred the birds. That has not happened. So, right, I mean, again, coming back to it, but the thing is, those are places where the birds come and settle for a period. This is a major migratory path for the entire migratory birding population of our country. For those three or four months, they move back and forth. So, it's like sort of our concern is it may shut the highway. They're coming through wind farm zones in southern India. Southern India is full of wind farms. So, I, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure they're flying right through all that. So, it's something, you know, I'm not an avian expert. That's something people have to figure out. What would the impact be of these structures that are going to be sitting, you know? Obviously, they're going to be like a kilometer apart. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, Vakit Sri Lanka, yes. Okay, gentlemen, you will take one more question. If anyone has one more question, then we'll crack off today's one. So, any more questions? We have time just for one week. Not a question, but a comment with regard to the coal power thing. Studies have been done over the last 150 years on the rain patterns that are falling in the hills up in Norelia, which is our watershed area. Uh, actually, the rainfall has come down by as much as 50% uh, caused by and the acid rain that just fall on the trees in places like the Horton Plains where studies have been done. Uh, now, Horton Plains is in theory in the dry zone. It's no longer in the wet zone. It has now come down to that level. Uh, I can't remember the exact precise number but the number of millimeters of rainfall that you get annually uh, in the Horton Plains uh, has come down so much and the trees are dying. I mean, the research mm. is out there, uh, it's available. Uh, what is the reason for the acid rain? The reason for yeah. Yeah. So acid rain, due to acid rain, which is coming from the coal plants in India. <laughs> So we, we, we don't have, no, we don't have, I mean, but I think we have, 
that the country itself can put pressure on India, right? You know, that's the reason. We can't have shock them about fishing, but the reality is that we are trying, right? We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. We are both already, and then they will do it. So it is deployed, deployed Sri Lanka moving forward. So all you know the brainy people who can do something and get it. We can't stop the war. All is there. So how can we stop the war power? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are almost uh, half the time, and we can be close for Q and A. Okay. Okay, good evening everyone, I'm uh, Kumud Herat and on behalf of the Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Engineer Mayarud Boteju for this very uh, informative and interesting lecture on uh, not only wind power but also an issue which uh, probably not many of us thought too much uh, in avian, impact on avian. I mean, a lot of people talk about the, the aesthetic side, uh, you know, sort of polluting the landscape and uh, more on the noise pollution makes, but, you know, the avian issue is uh, at least something new for, for, for the Sri Lankans uh, when it comes to wind power. So uh, it certainly has been very uh, interactive. A lot of people had a lot of views on it and sometimes we kind of try to call the entire energy topic and uh, a lot of other issues so which means a lot of people were very uh, involved in it and it means it's a, a subject which Im impacts and affects everyone. So, without much ado, I'd like to call upon engineer uh, Parakrama Jayasinghe, who is a senior member of the Mechanical Energy Sectional Committee, to uh, hand over a token of appreciation to engineer Boteju. So, I would like to also welcome engineer Boteju on stage to accept this. Oh, I get a goodie. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure, a goodie, but just something to remember us by. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. So um, today was an excellent turnout. Uh, we had a, a, a huge headcount, which means uh, we are doing the right thing. And uh, of course, for those who are not able to join our lectures, uh, we have ways of disseminating this information. So knowledge has no value unless you don't share it and use it. And that's why we try to make use of technology. We have. Uh, this lecture and all the other previous lectures uh, as uh, on, on YouTube, and you can access this via our web page, uh, IESL. If you go to the IESL web page, you can uh, follow this link, go to the IESL videos, and you can uh, uh, watch this at home. And uh, you can do your own analysis. Uh, and also, if you're on Twitter, you can follow the uh, Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee on Twitter on this address. Uh, and yes, so today's lecture was uh, by engineer Mayra Buteju, who is a consultant on wind power and renewable energy. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a series of uh, lectures organized by the sectional committee. And we have another one uh, on the 6th of March. And this time, uh, uh, internationally recognized expert on decision making, Dr. Errol Weersinger, will be uh, presenting on the science of decision making perils and remedies and of course we make decisions uh, all the time at home, at work, uh, personal, professional and uh, we'll try to sort of uh, give a scientific approach on how to do it. So with that we wrap up and we thank everyone who was here and we welcome everyone again to join us and wish you all a good night and, a, and safe travels.